Thanks, Nev, Nev and, and Cathy for reading. Good morning, everyone. My name's um, Graham. If I haven't met you before, uh, I'd love you to have open Joshua chapter 4, the passage that, that uh, Nev just read for us. That'll be really helpful. And uh, what's important for me on this morning is that I spend a moment bragging uh, just publicly because just in case my parents are watching this video because I did ring my mother first before my brothers and that's important. Um, <laughs> do you have brothers and sisters? Do you, is there a bit of a competition there? Who rings mum first on Mother's Day? There is with us. I win it every time. My brothers are hopeless. Anyway, there you go. That's important. Now, on much more important things, um, make sure you've got your Bible open in front of you. That'll be helpful. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab one from the foyer right now. You can get up and go and get one, or maybe on your phone um, or an iPad or something like that. Uh, there's an outline in your bulletin, and uh, we'll have a, a Q&A uh, at the end as well, and we'll see if I can answer your questions, or I might be able to say, well, I'll see you next week with that answer. Now, look, the, the big word that we looked at last week, and by the way, if you do miss a week, uh, you can catch up on, um, on our YouTube channel. There's a link on our website as well if you can't find it. But go to YouTube, search Robertson Burrowing Anglican Church and you'll find our channel. You can subscribe to that and you'll get reminders and so on. So if you do miss a week, go back and see the video because these sermons really do work well together. It's much easier if you follow along. It's also much easier too if you're reading along with us. And so for next week, um, I'm asking you to read chapters 5 and 6. There you go. Now last week, our big word as we thought about uh, this act, this moment in history as the, when, when the Israelite people crossed the Jordan into the land that God had promised them. Last week, the big word was continuity. In other words, that's the continuity of God's promises. Through Abraham, we looked right back at Genesis 12, and then through Moses, and now through Joshua, God is keeping his promises. He, God is the God who, who makes and keeps promises. God is giving them a place to live, a land. He has created a people to live there. These people are assured of the presence of God. And for those of us who like a few visuals, this gives you a bit of an idea of a helpful timeline of where we're at. It's not in scale, but you'll get a bit of an idea. It's a big picture view of where we are in God's plan of salvation history. So here's, here's Moses, and remember Joshua comes just after Moses. So that's what we're looking at. There's David a split of the kingdom, and down here, New Testament. So that's where we're looking at. There's Abraham, just up there, just after Moses was Joshua. We, today, we're going to pick things up in chapter 4. However, a few things have happened to get us to this point in this uh, narrative, in, in the account. And as I said, I hope you've been reading along in the, uh, our little reading plan. In the second half of chapter 1, so if you've got a Bible, just sort of flick back with me. You can see a few of the, the headings and that sort of thing that sometimes are, most of the time, are helpful. The headings, of course, are put there by the Bible translators. They're not part of the Bible. Um, and most of the time, they're pretty good. So in, in, uh, uh, what, what's happened to this point? Well, in the second half of chapter 1, we read of Joshua preparing the people and the people obeying Joshua just as they did Moses. And so in Joshua 1, verse 16... Then they answered Joshua, whatever you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obey Mo obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with us as he was with Moses. Again, that's that continuity, isn't there, of leadership. In chapter 2, uh, and you can see here's a little map that I showed you last week. And this is the, the part we're looking at. There's the plains of Moab and there's the, the Jordan River. And that's where they cross and there's Gilgal, which is mentioned in, the, in today as well. So just have that in your mind. Okay. And so in chapter 2, the preparations to cross the Jordan and take the land God was giving them continue. Joshua sends two spies into the land to check it out. They go to Jericho and they stay at a, a lady called Rahab, her house, and with her family. Now in 2 verse 2... Well, we're told the king of Jericho knows the spies are there. I think they should have stuck to their day job. Um, they got sprung straight away. Rahab is a prostitute and Rahab is a Canaanite. So very much an outsider. It couldn't be more of an outsider. Yet she is welcomed into God's people. She confesses that the God of Israel is truly God. 
She hides the spies from the king's henchmen as they look for these two spies. And the spies promise not to harm Rahab and her family when the time comes. And we get to that actually in chapters 5 and 6. The spies return to Joshua and uh, after a few days. And in Joshua 2 verse 24, so if you've got your Bible there, you can read it with me. Joshua 2 verse 24, The Lord has, set, has surely given the whole land into our hands, the spies said to Joshua. All the people are melting in fear because of us. Now remember that phrase, we'll get to that in a moment. The next morning, Joshua and the Israelites set out from, um, well, I'm going I'm to let you wrestle with the pronunciation of that place in 3 verse 1, S-H-I-T-T-I-M. Don't say it out loud. Um, you try to tell me what the right pronunciation is. Anyway, they... they <laughs> They uh, leave from that. I can hear a few people trying it. Don't do it now. <laughs> Don't try it. Um, anyway, they, they, re- they, uh, they make camp on the eastern side of the Jordan, right? And the Lord speaks to Joshua, telling him he will provide a sign which will show the people that the living God is with him, with them, just as he was with Moses, and that he will keep his promises and drive the nations out of the land. Now Joshua was to choose 12 men, priests, to carry the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was special because it carried in, in it with the Ten Commandments, the law that was given at Mount Sinai. But even more special because it symbolised, it represented God's presence with his people. So they were to carry this Ark, and have a look at 3 verse 13, and as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. Ring a bell? Sound familiar? Well, here's Moses, the, story, the crossing of the Red Sea, the Exodus. Again, we come back to that a fair bit. At the end of chapter 3, we find, well, that, well the end of chapter 3, record exactly what God had promised Joshua uh, would happen. Uh, the waters which were in flood at that time of the year. So we're not talking a little bit of a stream. Uh, we're not talking the Winger Caribbee River. Uh, we, are, we are talking a very wide expanse of water, probably over two kilometres possibly wide. In, in flood at that time of the year, there's a lot of water around and fast moving. Well, we read there that the waters did stop and as soon as the priest's toes hit the water and uh, all the nation crosses the Jordan on dry ground. Okay, now... We're up to speed with the story. Uh, if you've been reading along, and I do encourage you to do that, then you would have read those things. We're now, we're now going to spend a bit more time in chapter 4. Remembering. Remembering is an essential part of the Christian life. It's a, it's a, it's a profoundly human activity. You've probably got um, your own strategies to help you remember. Uh, keys place strategically in places around the home. If you're going out and you don't want to forget something, I'll be known to put my keys in the freezer so I don't forget the ice cream that we promised to take. Um, songs might help you remember. People will write songs. Uh, I know people who are studying and they, were, they were, will write a song uh, to help them remember what they needed to study. I like lists myself. That helps me remember things. Many of us wear items of jewellery to remind us of loved ones. Little trinkets on bracelets maybe. Rings, um, special earrings. People tattoo themselves to help them remember. Uh, Michelle and I have our wedding bands tattooed on our fingers just in case we forget we're married. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so we remember, we remember and we celebrate anniversaries of our births, um, marriages and special days in our nation's history. They help us to reflect they help us to reassess. They help us to readjust in the light of the past. Uh, on Anzac Day, we repeat year after year, we will remember them uh, lest we forget. In chapter 4, we read of 12 stones taken from the Jordan River, set up at Gilgal. These were designed for a similar purpose, remembering. A purpose in the, in the ongoing life of the nation of Israel. They were to remember the Lord, they were to remember his saving work, they were to remember his promises. We're going to read from chapter 4, verse 1. 
I'll take a bit of time to read through a few of these verses. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord, and it's probably better to say here, and grammatically in, in the Hebrew there's a had there, it's looking back. So the Lord had said to Joshua, and it's a reference back to 3 verse 12, which we read earlier, Choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe. And just pause for a minute there, notice the emphasis. Notice the emphasis on unity. One from each tribe, one people under their one God, each tribe represented. Verse 3, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. Verse 4, so Joshua called together the 12 men and had... He had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God in the middle of the, of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, What do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan... The waters of the, uh, the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. See verse 6 there? What do these stones mean? That's the question that the future children of Israel will ask and that's the question that they'll be led to ask. What do these stones mean? At the uh, War Memorial in Canberra, if you haven't been there, you should go. Um, there's, a, there's the roll of honour. Uh, the, there it is there. It, it is a breathtaking memorial of... Uh, it's more than 100,000 members of the Australian Armed Forces who have, who have died in, in battle. It clearly demonstrates to all who see this and who walk along it the horrific consequences of war. You can't miss it. But it's not just for those who walk along it today... Its purpose is for future generations, for them to reflect, for them to reassess, for them to readjust in the light of the past. As future generations and all those school students who go on the excursions in Year 9, whatever it is, <laughs> head out there, uh, to all the, all, and they see all those poppies there. They are forced to ask, what does it mean for me today? And that's the question the future children of Israel will ask and be led to ask as they see the stones piled up at Gilgal on the western side of the Jordan River. The stones will be a sign, an always present pointer to the great miracle of how God brought them into the land and therefore a reminder of the God who did it. It's a, the stones are a reminder that God keeps his promises. Now, the river crossing itself is not the only thing that takes us back to the Exodus. The language here uh, in, in Joshua, as we read, is similar to that used at the first Passover, uh, recorded in Exodus, the book. And that Passover ceremony would be the annual sign, that meal, that annual sign, that reminder of the miraculous deliverance of God's people from their slavery in Egypt and all that went with that. And so if I take you back here to Exodus chapter 12, verse 26. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony, that's the meal, uh, mean to you, then tell them it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. See, future generations need to know that these things really happened. We're talking history and they need to know that. They need to remember that. They need to know what do, the what do the stones mean and how they tell of God's character and how they tell of his promises. And let's notice uh, something else in, in 4 verse 7, of Joshua 4 verse 7. At the centre of it all is the Ark of the Covenant. Now covenant just means promise. It means that's what it means. So here's the Ark of God's promise. God is at the centre. He's even at the centre of the river, so to speak. His presence is, is, uh, is represented by the ark. And there's the ark at the centre of the river and they all walk past it. God's the hero of the story. It's not Joshua or anyone else. It's God. And God is keeping his promises. He's delivering, he's protecting and he's guiding his people. Look at the stones. They remind the people of all this. Verse 7, these stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel 
forever. Now, in chapter 4, verses 11 to 14, they serve as a bit of a summary. If you want to read ahead there, we read it before, to what we've seen um, from, really, chapter 3 onwards. Again, notice the similarities with the crossing of the Red Sea, and there's an intentional parallel, too, that I don't want you to miss. Uh, God has established Moses and now, establish, now establishes Joshua as Israel's human leader, and the people are united in awe or fear of him as their God-appointed leader just as it has been with Moses. So if you look at 4 verse 14, uh, that day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel and they stood in awe of him all the days of his life just as they stood in awe of Moses. And take us back, we'll go back to Exodus 14. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and they put their trust in him and in Moses' his servant. There's that similarity there. There's an intentional parallel here between Moses and uh, Joshua. Why? Because God keeps his promises. That's why. God keeps his promises. And whoever the leader is, God will keep his promises. Let's go to our outline. Outline's number, number two in outline. There's the, this melting, hearts melting in fear. We've heard that already read this morning. Um, and we're really looking at chapter 15, uh, sorry, 4 verse 15 to 5 verse 1. Now in this section, we find the focus shifts from the events uh, the event of what the crossing meant to Israel to what, is now, what it now means to those outside of Israel, the kings of the Amorites and the Canaanites beyond the Jordan to the west. Now, their, their reaction is summarised in 5 verse 1. Now, we didn't read this earlier, but it's up on the screen. Now, when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until they had crossed over, their hearts melted in fear. And they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. There's a repeated emphasis on the miraculous, isn't there? In the end, this is what causes the nations to fear. What God could do this? What God could be so strong and so mighty that to do these things, we're not going to we're not, we, don't, we dare not take them on. As soon as their sandals hit dry ground on the western side of the river, well, the waters returned. See, only God's power could do such things. Let's notice two further insights, both in verse 24, before we spend some time thinking about what this means for us today. I hope you're still with me. After reminding God's people of the miraculous work of the Lord, and we see that in verses 22 and 23, and notice the emphasis, the heart of the story, the hero of the story is God. Joshua says this in chapter 4, verse 24. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful. And so that you might, know, might always fear the Lord your God. You see, there's two reasons why God chose to do it this way, this miraculous way. We see them here in verse 24. Two reasons why God chose, why, why the entry to the land is being done in this way. The first is that God wants all the world to know that all power is in his hands. He is strong and he is mighty and there is nothing our God cannot do. I loved it when we sang that before, by the way. And I, we should have, where's Grace? We should have taken a photo because everyone was doing the actions. It was awesome. Strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. That's why he does this miracle. There's nothing our God cannot do because he is the one true living God. He is the creator of everything and everyone. And it was never his purpose to restrict this knowledge, his, sal his saving grace, to just Israel. You see, so that all the peoples of the earth might know. Israel's purpose, God's purpose, was always to be evangelistic to have the word get out there, to invite others in. That's why Rahab is there at the start of Joshua. Rahab's that perfect example, the complete outsider, a prostitute and a Canaanite. It couldn't get any worse. He is an outsider. And that story is there in Joshua to remind us that in verse 24, so that all the peoples might know that anyone can come and join that nation. Israel's purpose was to be a light to the nations. Now, sadly, if we keep reading through our Old Testament, we watch the accumulated failure and ultimate refusal of Israel to be this servant light bearer to the nations. Uh, climaxing, of course, with the crucifixion 
the trial of Jesus Christ, God's son. There's a second purpose, though, isn't there? A second purpose of why God chose to do it this way. And see it in verse 24 again. Why? It's the second half of it. So that you might always fear the Lord your God. God wants his people to know, as they settle down for their first night in the land of promise, the land of rest, that they are there only because of him. If it wasn't for the Lord, they'd still be in chains in Egypt. If it wasn't for the Lord, well, they would have all died in the wilderness. If it wasn't for the Lord, they'd still be stuck on the other side of the Jordan. If it wasn't for the saving work of God, God's people would be lost. Therefore, their only proper response must be a continuing reverent awe and love for God because he's God. You know, we, um, we cannot manipulate God. Give it your best shot, but you won't be able to do it. We can't deceive him. We can't hide from him. But we can trust him. We can obey him. And we can love him. Why? Because he first loved us. And that's what the Israelites needed to continually remember. And if the hearts of God's people melt in such loving gratitude and faithful servants service to him, well, they will never melt like the Amorites will melt with terror, like the Amorites and Canaanite kings who know, know they are on a collision course with Israel's mighty God of all the earth. Okay, so what about today? What are we going to say? Well, surely if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus today, doesn't this chapter show you that all our hope is found on, on the God who, is, who does mighty things and that we need to be reminded of what they are and when they happened? Surely that's what we've got to see here. Isn't that simply what we must hear today, especially with all that is going on in our world today? We need to hear the simple, plain fact that God is strong and mighty and there is nothing our God cannot do. You walk away with that today, I'm happy. Problem is, in the business of life, with all the distractions and the good things we enjoy, too often we forget. So God gives us, well, God gives us his word. We can read about his word and his, promise, his promises in his word. Uh, we can, God has given us the scriptures. It's worth asking, do you read your Bible? Do you read your Bible? You're missing out if you don't. You know, one way to look at the Bible, and don't get, you know, don't get put off, it's not, not too soppy, don't worry. Um, the Bible is a love letter to his people. It's God's love letter to us. Why wouldn't you read it? It's God speaking to you. Read it, pick it up and read it. Hear, from, hear his promises and remember that God makes and keeps promises. Uh, it's another, another, one of the reasons why God has given us the blessing of church is to help us remember. Here we are today and we're all remembering right now, aren't we? All of you, it's great. That's, that's one of the blessings of church. We're remembering because we need remembering because we get distracted and life gets busy and so on. Uh, Christian friends are the same. Having those great gospel conversations with people. Remember together. Being part of a small group. Remembering God's work in our lives. Uh, uh, God's work in history. One writer I read during the week um, said this, and I think it's worth repeating in full. I, I'll, I've got the whole little quote there. So it's from um, one of the commentaries I've been reading. In a culture like ours, addicted to novelty, it's, it is easy to fall into the temptation of judging the effectiveness of our use of God's means of grace by how much new understanding we have. Of course, we want to grow in our knowledge and love of God, but that is often a deepening of what we already know or a new application of old truths rather than startling new discoveries. We all need to be reminded constantly of the basic the most basic realities of our Christian experience, the foundation on which everything else depends. It's good. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not, not rocket science. Or we, we say in our family, it's not rocket surgery. Um, you know, we do this in our preaching. 
Uh, in the Lord's Supper, we remember. In our songs, we remember. Even in our conversations, we must rem- remind ourselves of God's actions in, in his saving history. By word and example, we need to tell the next generation that the Lord's hand is mighty, strong, and there's nothing is too hard for him. God speaks, we obey. God acts, we remember. Perhaps I can close with this uh, from verse 24. It's one of the purposes of God's actions is that, that all the people of the earth might know of God's rule and power. Jesus has achieved a far greater rescue in his death and resurrection for us. What, what are we going to do to continue to remember this, light, this world-changing event? What are you going to do? What are you going to do so that the people of the earth might know this life-changing event of God's saving act on the cross? How about we pray and uh, then we'll see if there's any questions or comments. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your, um, your word to us today. Lord, we pray that we remember it. Amen.